Hi everyone, welcome to this evening's uh, special presentation. Um, this event is sponsored by the Peace and Conflict Studies Program, as well as the Peace Studies Student Association and Peace Power Magazine. Um, we are very honored tonight to have a special guest from India. Dr. <coughs> Anki Matai is um, a, a Gandhian scholar who teaches at the School of Gandhian Studies, and he is also the author of the book Mahatma Gandhi's Worldview, which I am very honored to have in my personal collection, thanks to my friend Chelsea, and author of many other books as well. And tonight he is going to be speaking about the current state of the Gandhian movement in India, um, a little bit about the background of the Gandhian movement, and he will probably also be talking about whatever you would like to hear about. So thank you very much for coming tonight, and please join me in extending a warm UC Berkeley Go Bears welcome to Dr. M.P. Matai. <laughs> This, this is the book in question. It's uh, uh, gracing my bookshelf. How much time is it here? 80 minutes. 80? 80, 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. Yes, an hour 20. <clears throat> Friends, <clears throat> I must just say I'm really honored to be here uh, talking to you in in Berkeley. But this is not my first visit. I was here in 2001, again around this time, that was uh, three weeks or so after the 9-11 event. Uh, but that time I was talking about the, the response in India to the 9-11 event. How the people of India, the press of India, responded to the 9-11. At this time I am called upon to speak on the Gandhian movement in India today, or the status of Gandhian work in India today. You know, this is a subject on which we can talk very elaborately, which might take a lot of time, so I would like to know precisely as to whether you have some questions in mind, some ideas about how I should go, then I'll be able to, you know, kind of reorganize my talk uh, to cater to your uh, specific needs and questions. Yeah. Uh, I hope this doesn't sound trivial, but I'd like to know, I understand that there's a comedy that's very popular in India right now about a... Um, uh, yeah, by the, uh, a criminal who takes on Gandhian methods and it's supposed to be very popular. So and you you mentioned a movie? Yeah. 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 I also have heard about this movie, but I have not seen the movie. But those who have seen the movie told me that it is uh, very, very effective in communicating the message of Gandhi to the people, ordinary people. So since I have not seen the movie, I may not be able to make any observations. Could, could you just start with maybe talking a little bit about w what is going on post Gandhi? What has happened and where are we now with the Gandhian movement and what the Gandhian movement is doing? And then maybe we get into some more of the audience questions. I think that would be useful, especially for our viewers on the internet. Well, <clears throat> you know, Gandhi wanted the Indian National Congress, which was the organization which struggled for Indian independence to be disbanded after we attained independence. And a new organization formed, which he called Lok Sevak Sangh, meaning an organization for serving the people, a people's service organization. And this idea was placed before the leaders of the International Congress, and they rejected it outright. They said that they want this organization to continue as a political organization, and that continued. But even during Gandhi's time, there were two streams in the Gandhian movement, in the nationalist movement. One stream was really consisted of uh, people who were interested in power politics. 
and the other was people who were interested in rural service. Gandhi had a program called the Constructive Program, which was a package of 18 items intended to rebuild society, rural society from bottom with the participation of the people. So there were thousands of people, you know, taking up this constructive program work in rural areas. They were doing a kind of silent village service. The other stream consisted of people with a political orientation, you know, offering civil disobedience and uh, other uh, programs of the national movement. So when India got independence, you know, those people, those politically oriented people, naturally, you know, went into the Indian National Congress and they continued to be active in the political front. While those who were doing the constructive work activities continued their work. So when Gandhi said that there should be a new organization uh, in order to carry out the work of uh, rural reconstruction, what he called building Swaraj from below. Swaraj was the word that he used for freedom, which was much more than political independence. It was, uh, you know, empowering people and strengthening, you know, the rural masses and so on. So, Gandhi was assassinated on the 30th of January 1948, a few months after India became independent. So this dream of Gandhi, which he really wrote down and which is known as his last will and testament, was to be carried out by a group of uh, uh, people who were active in the constructive work program. And there was a very well-known Gandhian uh, we don't say the, the disciple is not the right word. Gandhi never believed that he had disciples. His uh, co-worker called Vinoba. And so Vinoba convened this meeting in Gandhi's ashram in Seva Gram. And a new organization was formed called Sarva Seva Sangh. Means an organization, a forum for serving all people. Instead of Lok Seva Sangh, they used, used the word Sarva Seva Sangh. And then, this Sarvaseva Sangh is an apex organization to coordinate the various activities of the Gandhian movement. Because I said there was a, uh, the rural reconstruction work carried out by Gandhian organizations in rural areas. Even during the freedom struggle, Gandhi had formed several organizations. Say, for example, for the propagation of hand spinning and hand weaving what he called Khadi, and promoting village industries, he had formed an organization called All India Khadi and Village Industries Association. Then, for the promotion of the cause of the untouchables, an organization was formed called the Harijan Sevak Sangh. Harijan was the term that Gandhi used to designate the untouchables. And for the women's empowerment, and similar problems associated with, uh, you know, women. There was a trust formed named Kasturba Trust after the name of his wife. And so several organizations were there like this. And, you know, the Sarvaseva Sangh was coordinating all these organizations. These organizations were autonomous organizations. And while maintaining their autonomy, you know, it was coordinated at the national level by the Sarvaseva Sangh. And at the state, the Sarvaseva Sangh had state units and they are called Sarvodaya Mandals. And this is, in fact, a general structure of the Gandhian movement. You know, each organization has its focus and its, you know, activities in rural areas. What happened was that after independence for a certain period of time, the political wing, which was represented by the International Congress, and the constructive wing, represented by various organizations and coordinated by the apex body called Sarvaseva Sangh, worked side by side in unison with each, each other. But there came a point of time when 
power started corrupting people who assumed the positions of power and they were not actually trying to translate the dream you know presented before the country by gandhi in the practice you know gandhi had presented a model of development before the country and this model was rejected by the leaders of the many leaders of the international congress particularly by nehru and the, and uh, the others who came to power they accepted the western model of development and wanted to rebuild india after the image of the industrially developed west so this has really led in, to a conflict between those who believed in the gandhian model and those who promoted the western model who came to power so naturally a conflict arose between the gandhian movement and the people in the government who during the freedom movement worked together for the larger goal of the political independence of the country this actually alienated the gandhian movement from the government to a considerable extent and there was one leader in the gandhian movement vinoba vinoba bhave who really tried to bring the movement closer to the government he did not want the gandhian movement to launch direct action non violent direct action against the government he said that the time of non violent direct action has come to an end and it is the time for cooperating with the government for rebuilding the country so he launched a movement in the 50s for uh, land reforms which is known as the land gift movement i don't have time to go into the details of that the land gift movement was a a very successful movement if you go to the statistics you know they succeeded in getting 4.8 million acres of land as gift and more than 1 million acres of land was distributed among families who had no land of their own and the government cooperated to some extent with this movement but in 1969 vinoba just uh, closed the land gift movement and withdrew into his ashram in a place called pavanar in central india the land problem remained unresolved to a considerable extent and then people who believed in violence stepped in and that created a different situation and there was another important follower of gandhi and a great leader of india called jayaprakash narayan and jayaprakash narayan continued the work in the rural areas of india particularly in the states of uttar pradesh bihar and other areas and you know addressing the problems faced by the people and trying to find out a non violent solution to it and some of the problems really demanded non violent direct action against the government the governments that ruled the states and the government that ruled the center so confrontation could not be avoided and it reached a crisis point in the 70s early 70s when some of the state governments and the government at the center became highly dictatorial and corrupt and therefore a people's movement was launched against these corrupt governments showing totalitarian tendencies and that assumed the dimension of a people's revolution known as the total revolution it was a total revolution a revolution in all areas of public life that was what uh, yaprakash narayan visualized this resulted in the declaration of the internal emergency in the country by the then prime minister mrs gandhi and uh, civil rights and freedoms were really a bridge curtailed freedom of the press was uh, taken away 
and the country was almost in the grip of a kind of dictatorship. But you know, on the surface everything was smooth, but people were revolting. And it reached a point where Mrs. Gandhi was compelled uh, to cancel the emergency and declare elections. And in the elections, the party led by Mrs. Gandhi, the Indian National Congress, was routed completely. And a new government, uh, or a Janata Front government, <coughs> which actually J. J. Prash Narayan put together, came to power. And then there was a kind of relapse for the Gandhian movement. Because they thought that a movement, a, a political uh, coalition, although it was called a Janata Party, it was not really a party, it was a kind of coalition. Which was actually the creation of the Gandhian movement has come to power. And therefore, you know, there may be a qualitative change in the administration as well as in the development model uh, to be pursued by the new government. But, you know, the government was a disaster. It crumbled due to internal contradictions and other factors. And then another election was declared, and Mrs. Gandhi again returned to power. And when she returned to power, she appointed a commission of inquiry called the Kudal Commission to inquire into the activities of the Gandhian organizations. And this commission was engaging itself in an act of witch hunt. All Gandhian organizations were put to innumerable difficulties. Through continuous statements, you know, they were discredited. But there was an attempt at discrediting these organizations in the public estimation. Although this commission was constituted for a period of six months, it continued, its term was extended and extended, and it continued until five years. And during this period, the movement, you know, actually lost its team. It crumbled, I would say it crumbled. Many people joined several political parties in the movement, from the movement. Some people left the movement and formed their own non-governmental organizations, non-profit organizations. Some people left political li public life and withdrew into their uh, own private activities. So there was a kind of collapse of the Gandhian movement uh, following the uh, Kudar Commission. But yet, you know, it didn't really really got lost. You know, there were several people who really wanted to hold on in the face of these adversities, and the movement continued. The work was only nominal. It failed uh, to make any national impact, or even at the regional level, it did not create much impact. But still, the, the, the movement continued its work. And uh, then we enter a next phase of the Gandhian movement, that's with the beginning of the globalization and marketization of the 1990s, which, which was initiated in 1991. New challenges came to be thrown up. You know, capital was allowed to move freely into the country. Foreign direct investment increased. So multinational corporations and transnational corporations started coming into the country. Huge projects funded by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund uh, was uh, started in different places. This created a very difficult situation in rural areas because these huge development projects started displacing people in large number, particularly the tribals or the aboriginals in rural India. And in several places, the new factories that came in actually started appropriating the scarce resources of the people. And many of the small scale factories were closed down because you know, large scale factories started coming in. 
and this resulted in retrenchment of employees. So, there were problems in rural areas which were to be addressed by, you know, people's movements. So again, the Gandhian movement got active. It had to come together and became active. And it was felt that the movement, because it lost much of its enthusiasm and its team, may not be able to address some of the issues effectively. There were several movements coming up in rural areas, the grassroots level, you know, addressing these problems originating locally. And therefore we thought that something has to be done about it if there should be an effective, you know, uh, effective kind of uh, resistance to be built up against uh, these forces which are really causing havoc in the rural areas. So we thought that there should be a co an effective coordination of the various people's movements working in different areas of the country. So we thought of forming an alliance, a national alliance. And the initiative was taken by the Gandhian people in the Gandhian movement and also people engaged in some other major resistant movements like the Narmada Bachao Andolan in the Narmada Valley. We traveled, I was in the team, we traveled in all parts of India, almost all parts of India I should say, and met people in their areas of struggle, where they were really struggling. We went to the villages, to the rural areas, where there were struggles taking place, movements organizing resistance against some of the multinationals and other uh, forces which were really taking away their resources, talked to people. And there was a consensus that there should be a kind of a national alliance of these people's movement. So we decided to form a national alliance. A meeting was organized in the ashram of Gandhi in 1994, and a formal decision was taken to form a national alliance of people's movements. And now we have what is called the NAPM, that is the acronym, National Alliance of People's Movements, in which, you know, the Gandhian movement has taken a leadership role in the formation of this national alliance. Then another important thing that has taken place in recent years are struggles against uh, some of the multinational companies in various parts of India. And particularly, I can mention the instance of uh, a struggle in Kerala against a factory of Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola factory. You know, Coca-Cola established a factory in, in Kerala, in the district of Palghar, which is the birthplace of Eknath Ishwaran, who was in Berkeley for uh, many years and who is the founder of the Peace Studies program. It was just seven kilometers, seven miles from the place of birth of Ektadi Shwari. And you know the drinking water which people take from wells, you know Kerala is a place where every family has a family well. You know that is one of the first things that people do before constructing a house they will dig a well and uh, you know water is available in almost all places. And the Adivasis also used to take water from their traditional wells. But once the Coca-Cola factory started over-exploiting groundwater, you know, most of the wells dried up. And some of the wells where water was available, it was highly contaminated, highly polluted. So it became a serious problem. And the local people got worried about it. So the Gandhian people from the Gandhian movement got involved. Then they convened a meeting of people interested in this issue and a struggle was started. You know, first of all the response of Coca-Cola was that if you don't have a, you know, portable water to drink, we will supply it in your own house. Mineral water or portable water. So they started, you know, supplying water. But the Adivasis, it was not acceptable for them because they had a traditional way of living 
and well and drawing water from the well, etc., is a part of their culture, their way of living. And they were therefore they were not satisfied with you know water coming in trucks or in bottles. So they did not accept this. And the struggle got intensified. I don't want to go into the details of the struggle, got intensified. And you know the political party which gave which was in power and which gave license to this company to start its operation in this place, realized that you know more and more people are getting organized. And it has become a massive, you know, people's movement. And unless they take a position, they will be alienated from the public. And therefore, they came forward and made a public announcement from the, the you know, direct action uh, spot. We call it a Satyagraha Pandal, a place where Satyagraha is organized. The shed of the Satyagrahis. That they made a mistake and therefore, it is necessary that the factory should close down and we are also supporting this movement. And now they are back in power and you know, last month they ordered the closure of the factory and the Coca-Cola factory has been closed down. But the factory people have got a stay from the court. But that is not going to make any change because people will not permit the factory to function. And a similar struggle is going on in the state of Rajasthan, in northwestern India. But it has not, you know, produced the same result as in Kerala. So similar struggles are uh, <coughs> led by Gandhian, in, in cooperation with the Gandhian movement. I don't say that they are in the forefront of it. That's one thing. So struggles against uh, this. And in the Narmada Bachao Andolan, the struggle in Narmada Valley, which is mainly a question of uh, the rehabilitation and resettlement of the people who have been displaced by this huge dam. You know, the Gandhian movement people is still playing an active role and it is, the struggle has been going on for the last 20 years and it has been a completely non-violent struggle and therefore it has almost caught international attention and people from different parts of the world are congregating in that place and expressing their solidarity. You know, several studies have come out on the level of the Gandhian movement today in India. And some of the major criticisms raised against it uh, by people like Thomas Weber, Ishwar Harris, Ashish Nandi, etc., who have studied the Gandhian movement. Uh, almost thoroughly and very critically, they say that Gandhians are not effective. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Gandhis are not what? Not effective. Ah, thank you. Not effective. They are not making any impact, either on the policy level, policy uh, making level at the government, or at the people's level. Uh, on the public level, either on the government or on the public life. And they also say that young people are not to be seen in the movement. These are two criticisms, major criticisms raised against the Gandhian movement by uh, people who have made a very incisive study of the Gandhian movement by traveling in different parts of the country, interviewing people, etc. And I would admit that Gandhian movement is not as effective as it was during Vinoba's time or during Jayaprakash Narayan's time. And one of the reasons that these people say, uh, point out is the absence of a charismatic leader like Jayaprakash Narayan. He was a very charismatic leader. I don't know how to answer that criticism, uh, except admitting that, yes, there is no charismatic leader now in the Gandhian movement. You know, most of the people who really worked with Gandhi, who were very young during Gandhi's time, and who continued to work in the Gandhian movement, have 